So uh, uh, I'll be talking about the OC1, C2 posterior instrumentation and uh, uh, the steps uh, for each of them. So we know that the craniovertebral junction is the most uh, uh, is the most uh, uh, important real estate in the entire uh, spine because not only it houses the upper cervical spine, upper cervical cord, but it also houses the lower part of the medulla, the cervical medullary junction, the lower cranial nerves, the vertebral arteries. Along with that, it is also one of the most mobile uh, segments in the uh, spine. And hence, uh, it is very susceptible uh, to develop instability. So the indications are uh, the indications are uh, common and known to all the traumatic injuries, basilar invagination, AADs, uh, neoplasms causing uh, cervical uh, uh, craniovertebral junction instability, infections like TB or pyogenic infections. Uh, so start with the occipital screw. So the occipital uh, screw, the easiest way to put the occipital screw is first to identify the external occipital protuberance, which is the prominent uh, landmark in, in the occipital area. So once you identify the occipital uh, external occipital protuberance, it's important that the screw placement is not done cranial to that because you have large uh, dural venous sinuses and it can cause torrential bleeding. Uh, placement of a bicortical screw. So the placement of the occipital screw is inferior uh, to the external occipital protuberance around the occipital keel, which is the thickest piece of the occipital bone. And the screw, the screw tip is usually very blunt. We put in, a, uh, we usually start with a handheld drill of uh, starting with six to eight mm and then gradually increase by two mm uh, till we reach the, uh, we, till we achieve a bicortical uh, Bicortical trajectory. For uh, C1, uh, the important thing is to note the three things. One is the transverse atlantal ligament, which is important as far as stability is concerned. It is attached to uh, the medial uh, end of the uh, medial tubercle of the C1 lateral mass. Uh, along with that, uh, the C1 lateral mass by itself is basically the articulation between. Uh, the occipital condyle cranially and the C2 uh, uh, and the C2 superior articular process inferiorly. The third important structure is the vertebral artery, which uh, exits from the transverse foramen and then makes a kind of a U-turn around the posterior end of the lateral mass along the upper border of the posterior C1 arch, and then moves anteriorly uh, and medially to enter into the dura. So the C1 lateral mass uh, have usually two trajectories which have been described, this conventional C1 lateral mass screws, uh, the entry point being at the midpoint of the C1 lateral mass, just inferior to the arch with a 10 to 15 degree medial angulation and is directed towards the anterior tubercle of C1. The C1 palm screw or the posterior arch lateral mass screw, sometimes also called as a C1 pedicle screw, is actually a screw which is placed in the posterior arch of C1 uh, with a 10 to 15 degree angulation. This uh, screw trajectory does not have a cranial trajectory, um, has a much more flatter trajectory. So uh, this is the, the black dot shows the entry point for the conventional uh, C1 uh, lateral mass uh, screw. Uh, so some authors described uh, uh, sacrificing the C2 root, uh, which is uh, retracted down uh, in, this, uh, in this image. So this uh, sacrificing the C2 root in the preganglionic area uh, opens up the entire C1, C2 junction, including the C1, C2 joint uh, uh, to place bone grafts in the C1, C2, uh, uh, C1, C2 joint and also exposes the entry point for the C1 lateral mass well. So as, as you can see, it has more cranial and a slightly more medial uh, trajectory. So the trajectory number one on the CT scan that you see is the C1 palm screw or the posterior arch lateral mass screw. As you can see, it's a much flatter trajectory. Whereas the, C, uh, the trajectory number two is the trajectory for the uh, 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 conventional C1 lateral mass, which has a much more cranial and a medial uh, angulation than uh, a C1 palm screw. So uh, as far as the C1 uh, screw is concerned, Adequate medial angulation is uh, critical uh, because uh, you need to avoid 
the hypoglossal nerve which is exactly on the anterior surface of the uh, of the c1 just on the lateral border of the c1 lateral mass uh, anteriorly uh, the carotid artery is also a few millimeters anterior uh, to the c1 hence long screw should be avoided and that's the reason why we target the posterior cortex of the anterior c1 arch while placing the screws and not the anterior cortex that is mainly to avoid the carotid uh, vessel and the hypoglossal nerve so the posterior c2 screws are of many types uh, three types uh, mainly the c2 pedicle screw the c2 par screw and the uh, more recently described the c2 translaminar screw uh, so the uh, c2 par screw is the screw which uh, the entry point is about 3 mm superior and 3 mm lateral to the medial edge of the c2 c3 joint it, it has a much more cranial trajectory of about 40 degrees and a very little or no medial angulation the c uh, the c2 pedicle screw has a much more lateral entry point compared to the par screw it is about 2 mm superior and 2 mm lateral to the uh, 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 c2 uh, par screw entry point and it has a much more medial trajectory and a much more flatter trajectory so simple way of remembering it is about 20 degrees uh, medial and 20 degrees uh, cranial so uh, the image on the left side the lower image on the left side that you can see the red uh, color is the usual trajectory for the c2 par screw as you can see the entry point is much more lower and much more medial and with a, a somewhat of straight uh, cranial trajectory the c2 pedicle screw has a much lateral entry point to traverse the c2 pedicle safely uh, but the trajectory is much more flatter it's about only 20 degrees medial and cranial so this is the usual uh, entry point which i discussed uh, so biomechanically the c2 pedicle screws are stronger than the c2 par screw it's usually about 18 to 24 uh, millimeters in uh, in length the par screw is about 14 to 16 uh, 14 to 18 millimeters uh, in in length the c2 i'll usually prefer to use the c2 par screw especially when i'm doing a subaxial uh, spine construct because the c2 par screw somehow lines up with the rest of the lateral mass a screw construct well however if i am doing a, only a c1 c2 uh, fixation then i usually prefer a c2 pedicle screw because that again lines up slightly better uh, with the c1 lateral mass screw now the c1 transarticular screws is basically the a very long c2 par screw so the entry point is exactly the same as the c2 par screw about 3 mm superior and 3 mm uh, uh, 3 mm lateral to the medial edge of the c2 3 joint uh, the trajectory, uh, uh, the cranial trajectory is towards the posterior cortex of the C1 anterior tubercle. So you can see in the next picture. So that's the posterior cortex of the C1 anterior tubercle. As you can see, it traverses through the four cortical surfaces, including the C1 C2 joint. And not surprisingly, this is biomechanically the strongest construct. However, you should remember that about 20% of cases, it's not possible. To do a c1 c2 transarticular screw fixation for the simple reason is that the vertebral artery can be high riding uh, in those cases and it's difficult to safely place a transarticular screw uh, the safest and the easiest screw to place in the c2 is the uh, translaminal screw uh, described by Wright in 2003 and this is basically the screw which is placed inside the lamina as you can see the entry point is in the spino uh, laminar uh, junction uh, the entry points are selected in such a way that the screws crisscross to the uh, opposite side the uh, the direction is towards the opposite side uh, facet joint of c2 uh, one screw is usually cranial and the other screw is usually the entry point is more uh, uh, inferior so i'll show a couple of cases uh, where we have used all these different kind of instrumentation and uh, so you see this boy here who had a uh, who had a pathological fracture four year old boy pathological fracture of c2 you can see atlantoaxial instability on the flexion extension uh, x rays so we studied the c1 c2 lateral mass and the vertebral artery and we thought we could safely do a c1 c2 transarticular screw this was a, actually a rare case of a uh, c2 langerhans cell histiocytosis this one and a half year scan you can see that the uh, c2 vertebral body and the odontoid is completely reformed and on flexion and extension there is no uh, residual instability 
So this is a 28 year old a lady with a spastic uh, quadriparesis. Uh, and you can see, so uh, so this uh, this uh, patient had a mass uh, which was arising from the lower end of the clivus, causing compre direct compression of the medulla and of the pons and the upper cervical cord. Now uh, this is a this uh, this is a classical case of a chordoma of the craniovertebral junction of the lower clivus involving the craniovertebral junction. The important point whenever we look at these lower clivus lesions is that they can erode into the occipital condyles since the lateral extent of the tumor uh, can uh, erode the occipital condyle and when we do a, a resection of these tumors from the endonasal endoscopic approach while resecting the tumors from the condyle you will end up causing an iatrogenic uh, occipital atlantal instability so this patient underwent a occiput to c2 c3 uh, instrumentation you can see the occipital screws are in place the screws are bicortical this is a c2 pedicle screw which is uh, inside the uh, uh, c2 vertebral body we usually prefer to go long in these cases uh, in uh, uh, because these patients will end up receiving uh, radiotherapy uh, following the uh, following the excision of the tumor and there is no chance for a uh, bony fusion so to achieve a good uh, biomechanically strong const construct we usually prefer to go long in these cases so this is another girl, a 19-year-old girl, who initially you can see the scans on the upper uh, uh, upper part that she had uh, survived, uh, she had uh, been diagnosed with tuberculosis of the C2. Uh, there was uh, gross osteolysis uh, that you can uh, see there, but no instability. Unfortunately, she had a fall uh, with the collar, and uh, because of the fall, she completely dislocated her uh, C1-C2 joint. You can. See See the facets are completely uh, look at the, the C1 uh, uh, C1 facet is completely anterior to the C2 facet, and uh, this uh, patient then underwent a C1 C2 uh, lateral mass screw fixation and a C2 part screw uh, placement, and you can see good formation of the odontoid and good fusion. So this is the last case. This is a case of an atlantoaxial dislocation that you can see on. Uh, this is usually picked up only on dynamic films either x-rays or ct you can see the atlanto actual distance increasing on flexion and decreasing completely on extension along with this the patient also has chiari malformation you see the cerebellar tonsils going right down into the cervical canal with uh, syrinx which is seen in the cervical cord so this patient then consequently underwent a foramen magnum decompression along with a occiput to c2 instrumentation the c2 instrumentation or placement of the c2 translaminar screw you can see the screws crisscrossing or to uh, to the opposite uh, sides so my take home message is that we need to be familiar with all types of occiput to c1 c2 in instrumentation because uh, uh, and we should avoid a one size fits all uh, approach for management of a complex craniovertebral junction uh, pathology Tailoring the instrumentation as per the disease pathology and anatomical constraints is extremely important. Thank you.